This is Defenders TV Podcast Episode 86, where we're looking at Luke Cage Season 1, Episode 12, Soliloquy of Chaos. You think I'm holding back? Welcome back, Defenders, to this episode of Defenders TV Podcast, episode 86, where we are looking at a soliloquy of chaos, and I'm surprised I was able to even pronounce that uh, hmm. two times in a row, um, soliloquy um, of chaos. Uh, I am one of your hosts, John, who is completely tongue-tied at this moment in time. You would think, as an Englishman who would have studied, you know, Shakespeare in school, that you would know the word soliloquy e- really easily to I... trip off your tongue as a British man. That is true, but you do realise that, as a youngster, I was tongue-tied. Really? I had to have the operation to uh, release my tongue slightly. I did not know that. Well, you should have done, because I have told you this before. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I only remember things you tell me on the podcast. But I'm one of your other hosts, Derek. Welcome back to Founders. Really good to have you here for the penultimate episode of Luke Cage. We've only got this and one more episode of Luke Cage to go. And the one making all the noise in the background. Hi, guys. I'm Chris. Perfect. Obviously, this is the penultimate episode of Luke Cage, as Derek said. And um, it is a hugely, um, yes... Chaotic one. It is. It is definitely a fairly chaotic episode of Luke Cage. But if you haven't subscribed to the podcast by this stage, what are we, 86 episodes in plus two specials with our interview with Justin Swain and our Doctor Strange uh, review? We're 88 episodes into this podcast. If you haven't subscribed by now, go on. Why not? Pop on over to iTunes. You can get there, there through DefendersTVPodcast.com slash iTunes. Subscribe to us on iTunes or you can subscribe to us on any good or evil podcast catcher just by searching for Defenders TV Podcast or Luke Cage. I think we're actually, we come up as number two behind uh, a very big produced network show um, which reviews Luke Cage. We come up as number two or number three. So we've been doing pretty good. Really good to have our listeners on board with us for this season of Luke Cage as well. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, for any um, discussion about this season or any of the episodes of Luke Cage, you can head over to our Facebook group, Facebook dot com forward slash groups forward slash defenders tv podcast you can follow us on twitter at defenders cast and of course if you have a lot to say on any of the episodes then you can send in feedback written at feedback at defenders tv podcast.com or go to defenders tv podcast.com and you can leave a 90 second voicemail where you will be aired live so to speak mm. on the podcast your yeah. thoughts and views on the podcast luke cage or anything to do with the marvel cinematic universe such as the awesome doctor strange movie we're going to be hearing about this up until the awesome spider-man movie mm-hmm. that is true it is now all roads lead to homecoming yeah. that's, that's true yeah there is a possibility next year as we lead into spider-man we're we're ever kind of kicking around the idea of doing a, uh, a spring of spider-man like we did our summer of strange where we review every movie in the spider-man series that might include the uh, the pilot for the 1977 TV show. What do you think, yeah. guys? Think uh, it I think to. it it's should. It's so corny. It has to. Excellent. Excellent. Although we could be here all the way through spring, summer, and autumn because there's a lot of Spider-Man And, movies. of course, there are a lot of Spider-Man and Stephen Strange hookups in the animated universe as mm-hmm. well. Yes, sir. I think can 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 you clarify hookups because all of a sudden there's fan fiction being written all over the <laughs> um, by that team ups. Um, there we go, taking down evil doers <laughs> yes. and monsters. Speaking of which, there was a Doctor Strange and a Hulk movie that just came out called Where Monsters Roam, um, a an animated movie where the two of them join up to beat monsters. That just came out uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we haven't reviewed it yet, um, but we have seen it. But we have seen it. I haven't. Yeah, the big bad is Nightmare. Oh, dun, 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 dun. which I learnt was the big bad that uh, Scott Derrickson did want to use in the movie. 
But, and I think I can agree with Kevin Feige uh, mm-hmm. and his view. Uh, I think this is on the Empire podcast. Scott Derrickson has an interview there. Um, he, he actually did say that Kevin Feige said, well, then you're just limiting yourself to the nightmare and the dream realm, whereas we want to introduce as many realms as possible yeah. uh, within this. So, good point. Absolutely. But choice. nightmare is such a great, um, character and antagonist for Doctor Stephen Strange. Yeah, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing him in hopefully Doctor Strange 2. Wait, Doctor Strange 2, Things Get Stranger? Yes. yes. Come on, that would be an amazing title. Or just Stranger Things. No, it, I think that's been taken. <laughs> yeah, but it you, would help the SEO or the search. That's on, true, on that's Google, true. Wouldn't it? But I was, yeah, and I was also just thinking, you know, like the 4D cinemas where the mm-hmm. seats move and you've got scents and you've got um, water being splashed on your face and all this kind of stuff. Um, a Doctor Strange one probably just needs to, like, pump in marijuana smoke <laughs> yeah. into, in, into the auditorium. Yes. And everyone can get trippy and, and wise to it. That is yes. the best way of doing 4D. Right, don't do jokes, kids. Uh, with yeah. that, I think we need to get on to this episode of Luke Cage. What do you think, boys? Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, for the 12th and uh, penultimate episode of Luke Cage, what do you do? You bring back some of the writers from the previous season who know the character better than others, and you bring back a director who's done some of the Defenders before. So for this episode, we the, it was written by Charles Murray, who wrote Step in the Arena, episode four of this season, and Akila Cooper, who wrote Manifest, which was episode seven. The director for this episode was Phil Abraham. He is probably uh, the guy that a lot of Daredevil rests on the shoulders of because he directed the first two episodes of season one of Daredevil and the first two episodes of season two. Um, there was an announcement that came out this week about the, the director for the first two episodes of the Defenders miniseries, which is going to be the director who did the first two episodes of Jessica Jones. My feeling is they might bring Phil Abram over to, to direct some of the episodes of Defenders as well uh, for that reason. Yeah, yeah that, that, that'd be great. be a cool Absolutely. idea to kind of, not only do you have the cast teaming up together, you also have the directors that brought them to life getting a couple episodes themselves, and that's a cool idea. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. John, do you want to tell us what they gave us for this episode with your synopsis? Sure. In the aftermath of the Harlem Paradise hostage situation, the neighborhood is thrown into confusion as the power players of Harlem come head to head. Stryker is in the wind, Alvarez is captured, and Cage is arrested once again on the radar of the NYPD. As Detective Misty Knight begins to suspect more players involved in the situation going down in Harlem, she assists Cage's escape from police custody. Alvarez also escapes from the police through his lawyer, as Stryker pays bail to get Alvarez released. But the double crosses with Stryker as he orders Zip and his thugs to kill Alvarez. However, they fail, sending Alvarez into the arms of another ally, Mariah Dillard. They in turn realise that in such times the enemy of their enemy is their friend and attempt to parlay with Luke Cage at Pop's Barbershop. However, little does Dillard know that her situation has become increasingly precarious as Misty Knight meets with Candice from the club who is willing to testify against Dillard if Knight can give her protection. Cage, still on the run from the police, tries to locate Stryker to bring his feud to an end, but discovers Domingo Colon's own power play against Stryker has ended fatally for him and his gang. As Cage, Dillard and Alvarez converge to parley, Stryker attacks with a new weapon that allows him to match Cage's power. Yes, we have the absolute crossover of Star Wars and Marvel Netflix with a pimped up stormtrooper. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm uh, I'm not too sure we're all uh, on board with this look. What do you think overall of uh, of the outfit for um well, I think um, this is going to lead me into my first point. Okay. You know, yeah, no, pimped go for it. up stormtrooper. Is it a wardrobe malfunction or is it um, absolutely right there and how it should be? If I'm honest, it slightly took me out of the um, kind of the tense atmosphere that was developing between the parties in Pop's Barbershop. I think... It obviously is referencing the comic book look, yes. absolutely, yeah. and I can get that. But I think it's an interesting twist that's happened here, I think, uh, for, for Luke Cage, is that a number of the looks have gone directly to the comic book, certainly for Stryker. Okay, they do the whole uh, 70s Luke Cage look as as a, a, an homage to that, whereas in Daredevil... 
they've kind of brought it out of that comic book look and, and updated it to give it that more armored look. Mm-hmm. And the, there's been that move away. Uh, here we really do see, um, the look referencing very strongly the, um, the comics. And part of me is slightly unsure. I'd love to absolutely know Chio Coca's reasons for why he's done that with Stryker, but obviously hasn't done it with Luke Cage because potentially it would look silly. So they've updated and modernized mm-hmm. it. Yet with Stryker, they've gone back to the comic book. Well, to be fair, the comic book so, look is a, it looks like a snake outfit. It looks like a snake skin. It's, it's very, it is very different, but it is kind of referencing the fact that he's wearing armor, uh, versus yeah. Luke Cage. I kind of thought the, the outfit looked a little bit like the Starship Troopers outfit because of the helmet. The helmet is my big distraction here for me. It makes logical sense. Obviously, if you have a bulletproof outfit, you don't have a helmet on top of it. People just shoot you in the head. It makes total sense why you would need something to cover your head uh, if you want to make yourself bulletproof. But it does look a bit silly. We only saw it for five seconds. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually loved the effect of the bullets um, rippling across the... The, the uniform and, and the, the armor, uh, as they, they flew out of yeah, Alvarez's cool. gun. I thought that was actually really cool, definitely. But it did look weird. And I have to say, I love the fact that the guy who's just done up Pop's Barbershop <laughs> does call it out as, you know, you look like a pimped up stormtrooper. Mm. What are you doing? And I mean, even more so that when, uh, you know, the a grenade has come down, he's kind of really just going, Sh- I've just fixed this place up. You know, what are you doing? It's like the refurb nightmare, to be honest. Absolutely. Yeah, I do. I do love that moment. We've lost Pop's Barbershop twice now so far this season as it's been destroyed this time with a grenade. Yeah. Chris, what's your thoughts on the uh, on the outfit? Um, That's not a thought. It's not even a word. <laughs> that, that's the best thought I can give. Uh, without giving too much spoilers away from my points, this episode didn't do it for me. Uh, it was a culmination of a lot of things, one being this outfit. Um, I understand from a realistic point of view, trying they're trying to anchor the Hell's Kitchen, the Defenders, the Netflix universe into a very realistic uh, variation of gritty realism of the MCU. Mm-hmm. That's fine. But it looked terrible. <laughs> If it looked more like Daredevil's outfit, I could actually buy it. Exactly. I think that was it. I think it just looked a bit too boxy, too uh, bulky. I, I, I don't know what it was. I just kind of looked at it and went, really? This was the best your costume designer, concept artist could kind of come up with? It's clearly that he didn't go to the Gladiator to get the the costume made. If he'd gone there, he would have got a cool costume like everybody else has, like Electra has, like Daredevil has, you know? Uh, he obviously didn't go to the right person to make his outfit for him. Well, Electra didn't really get a cool outfit. She kind of got a piece of cloth over her face. Kind of the... It's not like the whole... The the bullet blade kind Wasn't of... Wasn't it knife proof? And we, we did slag it off about the fact that she still didn't cover her arms. Uh, yeah. Which was really Yeah, silly. so like, it's kind of like... They literally listened to this podcast version when we were doing season two of Daredevil and went, damn, they're right. We really shouldn't expose layers of skin. Mm-hmm. Let's change Diamond back and just give him, like, let's go overdo. Let's give him Basically, a helmet. <laughs> yeah, let's give him a helmet and make him look like the 1970s costume. I get the homage. I guess I get it. I, it just didn't work for me. Okay. Potentially, they'll do a scale back version. Maybe later? I'm not sure. We've only got one episode left of the season, and I'm assuming this is just to set up the battle between Luke and uh, and Diamondback next episode. I'm not sure which one is going to be coming out of the other side of that, or both of them. <laughs> are they coming out the other side of it? So we will see in the next episode. I think we've talked enough about the costume, though. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would love just to know what some of our listeners think of, of the costume, because, I mean, I, I definitely recognize it as a throwback. It did pop me out of the the moment um it looked slightly strange um but i think maybe by the next episode i could be like yeah okay that's fine i can i can deal with it i i think it'd be good to know wardrobe malfunction or everyone's with the the pimped up gay stormtrooper oh that's how i'm forever gonna remember it now so with that chris what's your next point
Okay, guys, I'm going to kind of backtrack to one of our earlier episodes. I think it was probably in our first kind of three episodes. We started talking about how the theme of having a bulletproof black man as a superhero Mm -hmm. this time and day was such a great thing. Yeah. It was slightly on the nose in this episode where they was like, we're going to make sure you understand how special it is to have a bulletproof black man in Harlem as a superhero today. And I'm like, they literally, it was everything from the robbery scene. My God, they had a rap about it. <laughs> I was like, really, I, okay, there's nothing wrong with kind of constantly reminding us of this. So like, yes, we know Luke Cage is a fan of Wu-Tang Clan. He mentions it earlier. Mm-hmm. So having Method Man in there was fantastic. It was a nice cameo. But it felt too on the nose. It It's just the subtlety of the earlier 11 episodes where they they did talk about it, but it wasn't as in your face. Mm-hmm. In this episode, for me, it just, they didn't have that subtlety. It was Luke Cage flicking me on the forehead every time. It's like, doing, doing, doing. Are you getting this? Are you getting this plot point? Okay, well, this is good because this is, this is my first point. So, uh, I, I will, I will be able to respond to some of your, some of your questions that you have about the episode. Yeah. And my only bit is that, like, it's the subtlety. Mm-hmm. Like, that took me out of a lot of parts of the episode because I was like, it, I enjoy this series. I enjoy these characters. I enjoy the story that they're taking us on. Mm-hmm. But by replacing a lot of the, the more interesting elements we've had throughout the season in this episode, and I get they're trying to tie up everything, and that's great, mm-hmm. but this, the lack of subtlety of trying to go, we're going to force this story piece into here, it just took me, like, I'm, when I, you know when you're watching something and it's like, oh, this is, you're engrossed. Yeah. I was engrossed, and then they would do that, and I was like, oh, really? It's like, just, you know that, is that mental? <sighs> really? <laughs> Kind of like you're just sitting there going, uh, okay, I get it. Right, your point. I, I've talked about music since the beginning of the series. It's been pretty much a yeah. point for me every week, which has made my top five points pretty easy. <laughs> but for this episode, there's a couple of big points. And Chris, you did mention one of them there. Obviously, the appearance of Method Man, who's a member of the Wu-Tang Clan. It's really big. And they give it the gravitas it deserves. They give a great moment there, I think, in how they tackle it with Luke. Uh, stopping the robbery in the shop. I think that's there's some really fun moments in there and how they handle it. But the biggest part of this is the episode is called Soliloquy of Chaos. Um, the word soliloquy means uh, having a conversation or a dialogue about a specific thing that's going on. Um, obviously, the chaos that's going on in the city is the fact that you've got a superhero that has been battling uh, in Harlem's Paradise. Uh, people are, are accusing him of killing loads of people, of working with Willis Stryker. Um, so what's actually happened, the actual soliloquy of chaos, the discussion about the chaos, is the radio show that Method Man appears on to defend Luke Cage because he's met him face to face. He is on a radio show that's being broadcast all around the city of Harlem, possibly around New York, telling people he has met this guy, he knows this guy, is a defender of the people of Harlem. Um, so the whole conversation, why it's so on the nose is because he's sharing that story with people obviously in the universe of this television show not with us he's not that that story isn't for us it's for people who don't know luke cage and have seen him possibly on the front page of the newspaper on the on the tv news where they've been accusing him of these crimes and he's having this rap he's having the support for him uh, w- on behalf of the people of harlem on the radio show so i think that's that's the reason why it's so on the nose is because he's trying to convince people that may not know the story of luke cage that he is their bulletproof superhero um, so while, while I understand that it doesn't work for you as a viewer, Chris, that's totally acceptable, of course. But I think the reason why it feels so on the nose is because he's trying to get – that's his part. That's his role in the show is having this dialogue and having this conversation with some other members of the community to tell them this is the superhero you should be you should be following. Um, it does have that Western feel about it. It does have that bit about it where he's going, you know, he's the, he's the unnamed man kind of thing where he's in town. The sheriffs are all after him. Um, but we need to stand, we need to have his back. We need to stand behind this guy, which I thought was really cool. I thought that was a really, a really good idea. Yeah. I mean, I, I, re- I really liked it. I have to say. However, I think with, to be fair, actually with you, Chris, I can actually see your point. I actually mm-hmm. feel that. Instead of this being in the penultimate episode, where you kind of really want the story arc between Diamondback and Luke Cage to be the center of attention, building towards that. They, they had this conversation at the start, and 
because I think this more than any of um, the others, apart from maybe Daredevil season one, this does feel like a series of two halves. Yeah. Um, it feels like if this could have been the, this, this whole element of Luke Cage being accepted by um, the people of Harlem and on the street and the, the public opinion, the tide of public mm. opinion, which I really like in this episode. But I, I do feel that maybe if it had been in episode 10 or 9, that part, uh, or, you know, that Again, it, it could yeah. have just um, meant that, you know, building towards the end of this series, you um, are, are tying up that conversation of this man rather yeah. than it feels like it's opening it up again and in that sense i can understand uh chris's point absolutely but oh, totally. nonetheless i did really really like um the the whole method man cameo uh in, in um the radio station and in the corner shop yeah definitely and again I'm, I'm not i'm absolutely not taking away whether you enjoyed the scene or not that's not the point i think yeah. what i'm trying to say is there was a scene a couple episodes ago where he was caught on camera um, effectively attacking police is the way it was turned into on the news. So you had that whole bit. Now, an extra element that's been added and layered on on top of that is now the attack in Harlan's Paradise, which the police are blaming him for. Misty is saying, you are public enemy number one. They're looking at you. You are the only person that's being blamed for this. And I think to get the people back on side in Harlem is required in this episode. It has to happen or else Luke can't be the hero at the end of the series. He has to have this conversation with the people of Harlem and go, you need to be on his side. Two bits on this okay so one yeah method man that was great i do i i love that scene those scenes it could have been slightly earlier i think i agree with john's bit um like th if this was in episode 11 10 even at th that point but it couldn't have happened because the attack on harlan's paradise happened at the end of episode 11 no but so. and i i agree but what i mean is is i think because of how structurally Luke Cage has been done when mm -hmm. you've had the first six, seven episodes around Cottonmouth and then the remainder around Diamondback. It's almost like repeating the same conversation a bit. Like what I mean is, is that I think it could have been done earlier, the other stuff as well, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I think here, I think for me, maybe the problem of introducing this conversation again, which is one that I think it's great to continue, but it should be at a different point. And, and I think that it should be focusing on Diamondback and Luke Cage. I still want to know more about their story. I still feel, for example, that Alvarez is hugely ambiguous still. And I, you know, what I mean is, is I think there's still a lot to do with the characters here mm -hmm. rather than some of the other themes around here. Do you know where this could work? This could have worked with the, Episode 13, uh, we finished, it's been cleared, we've closed all the other bits, Diamondback's been taken care of, blah, blah, blah. And then it's a, like a fade to black, and then Luke's there walking down the street after like getting the shit kicked out of him. It's a day later, everything's terrible, and people still hate him. And then we end on that scene in the shop, and Method Man kind of pro proclaiming his amazingness kind of you know what i mean i i do i do and i'm gonna have to reserve judgment on whether that's the right yeah thing to no happen. exactly until after the 13th episode because my feeling is this is required to set up for the 13th episode yeah so i have a feeling and i hope it's not going to be like the spider-man thing where the city of new york rallies around spider-man in that horrible scene in, oh, uh, in the first Spider-Man movie. But I think it's going to be something similar to that. I think the city of Harlem is required to be on the side uh, of okay. Luke Cage. Uh, and if but that, we'll find out. If that is the case, then I will recant this piece. I'll remind you, I will, Exactly. Worry. The other thing, sorry, I just want to make point for any of our listeners. I'm not bringing this up because I have a problem with the piece of the Bulletproof Black Man. We've discussed this in previous yeah, yeah. episodes. If you're just joining in now, right, this right. is we we had a whole like three points about all of us chatting how great this was and this is mm -hmm. fantastically needed. I think my point was this is just, I've seen that already and I, I just didn't need to see it again. And I just right. In case any of our new listeners, you're just joining now there is no, we don't think this is a good thing. This was of all course, about. Of course. Um, absolutely, just the absolutely. On the nose piece. 
And just the other two quick points about the music in this episode, uh, music bits in this episode, I suppose. Some just really exciting cameos for me. It was really cool to see Sway in there. He's a presenter on MTV News for a couple of years. He's been a presenter of, uh, of a number of radio shows. He's a rapper as well. Um, one of the cool things about him is that he does a morning show, which gave Eminem his first uh, his first start on radio. It gave a number of uh, great rap artists. So he's quite similar, almost like an early morning radio host, kind of like a podcaster uh, who brings rappers on uh, with him to give their start, which I think is really cool to have him in there. It makes a bit, a bit more realism to that uh, to that. Um, that scene with Method Man on the radio. Uh, we also have Heather B. Uh, people of my generation yeah, probably yeah. know her pretty well. She was a, a rap artist who went on the first series of Real World Absolutely. Uh, on MTV, and she was a fantastic character. Yeah, on she that was show. brilliant. Loved really, her. really enjoyed her. Um, so really cool to see those two uh, on on uh, on this show as cameos as well, and another little tie up on the music, which is quite cool. Uh, John, do you want to give us your next point? Absolutely. I think actually this just follows on, uh, continues with the Method Man's line. I thought he had a great line, um, great lyric when he was rapping. It says, now we've got a hero for hire and he a black one. Mm -hmm. Uh, Really, really good. I love that. And I think that was because right at the start of this this whole um, episode or a a bit earlier, again, it's repeated with Method Man and and the the shop owner when uh, Luke Cage goes in to to, to stop the, the, the hold up. I love the fact that he goes, you know, a lot of people would I I know would pay for protection like that. Mm -hmm. It's another little dig for heroes for hire and Luke Cage again turning it down I'm kind of like going no stop and then Method Man (laughs) sort of brings this out again the hero for hire within his rap and I just love that little connection within this this episode because um, I certainly okay heroes for hire or hero for hire is not going to happen here in in this this series Mm -hmm. and if it does it will be right at the end where he decides that actually yes he will do that Um, but again it will be interesting to see what happens but I I love those little threads I I like those little nods back Um, and it's strange because I mean I do understand that I'm saying on the one hand you know, with Stryker's costume, I don't quite like that nod back, but yeah. I do like this nod back. I mean, I suppose it's just a question of different uh, ideas, Absolutely. and 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 you know, one is a a comic run, and it includes Iron Fist, and other is just simply the outfit. You know, yeah. so of course, um, much, much bigger. It's uh, but I love those. I really like that mm-hmm. um, line. And I have to say, I love the tune as well. Bulletproof love. Um, the the rap that. That's, uh, Absolutely. That Method Man does here has been released as a single as well. It's uh, it's the only single I think from any of the Netflix Marvel shows so far. So, uh, but I really do like it. I must say, really, um, really cool. Absolutely. And just one other aspect with regards to the hold up at the shop is when Luke Cage sees them running in. There is the Stanley cameo <laughs> where he says, "See a crime, report it," and it's it's Stanley with his finger. Uh, pointing out and he's there on the poster it's kind of like your country needs you mm-hmm. type uh, of poster um fantastic for our listeners here there is a large intense stare of hatred going directly <laughs> to my podcaster on the left why it's loving hate Chris. yes it's, it's loving, loving hate. hate the one thing uh so for new listeners i always do talk about the easter eggs this is obviously mm-hmm. one of the big easter eggs in this um the one thing i just wanted to talk about quickly then is uh, apparently now this is going to be Stan Lee's, um, variation throughout all the Marvel Netflix. He will only be the Stan Lee police officer in Marvel yeah. Netflix. That so, makes sense. That makes and sense. apparently, appa- according to the interwebs, he <laughs> will be making a live action appearance mm. in the Defenders. Interesting. So we've cool. only Very seen him up, including Iron Fist. We'll only see him up into the kind of the cop pit photo, and then in Defenders we will see him in the cop uniform in real life. Right, right. That sounds like a really cool idea. It I does. think so. Yeah. However, the NYPD would should be taken to court for like a guy who clearly should have retired like thirty years ago, still being forced into uh, a job. He is ninety six. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Ninety three. Yeah, so uh, they probably shouldn't be working like for the welfare force at, this at work and all that kind of. Thing. <laughs> Chris, do you want to give us your next point? Since John stole one of your one of your uh, your I Easter could, egg I points. just couldn't. I resist. knew you could. I, 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 I as soon as you went, I have something. I was like. 
I've um, told you before, Chris, if I say to you, tell us your first point and you have a big Easter egg, give it first because John will steal it otherwise. <laughs> okay, well, on that case, I'm going to change my second point. So, one of the biggest reveals we did get in this episode was Shade's real name. Mm-hmm. Hernan Alvarez. Now, this racked my brain. Like, I was going, um, who? What? Where? I don't know that name. And so after a, a good bit of time going down the internet rabbit hole, um, mm-hmm. I found that they, there may be a connection to the comics okay. for, for Hernan Alvarez. And now... So we know I, Shades has been in the comics. We have yes, mentioned that before, yeah, obviously. But, but the actual yeah. real name of Shades being mm-hmm. Hernan Alvarez. Um, sorry, I should have... Yes, there is a distinction. Um, cause there's two, they're two different characters that we, they're just kind of blended together. But, um, apparently in the comic books, uh, Shades has a son. Hernan Alvarez, I should say, has a son. Right. Who is currently serving as, and now spoilers, just turn off your mute. Okay. He's serving as the new power man in the comics. <sighs> Interesting. Yes. I did not know that. I did not know that. No. I'm not, I'm not completely caught up on the current run of the No, and neither am I. So this is where this came as a shock to me. So apparently this was a bit of a, uh, a quite a, a kind of a nod to the new comics. But right. additionally, this leads us to, well, they can go to places in the future if they want to. They mm-hmm. have Theo Rossi there. They can bring him. They could make him, like, rather than have the kid being Power Man, they could have him be Power Man for a while. Maybe, maybe. All these nice things. So we'll stay. That's one of the nice kind of Easter eggs reveals that yeah. I found. Let's hope it's not a huge plot point in the comic that's, uh, <laughs> that who his father is, because uh, we have probably definitely spoiled quite a bit. Oh, well, absolutely. But we don't know. So no, hopefully it's I, not. that's why hopefully I told spoiler alert. Yeah. You, you yeah. shouldn't. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but I, I, the one piece I did like was just speaking of the Rossi was the interrogation scene. Mm. Loy, er, er, and then he starts telling this great emotional story, and then goes, "Do you know who that was? Loy, er." <laughs> it was so good. So I was good. like, really I really "Oh, I." She looked like she was about to slap him. Because there that. was even yeah, a point. That was cool. There was even a point when I was looking at Priscilla, who was who was doing the interview with him, and I'm going. How can you think that this guy is actually going to tell you the truth? You haven't told him anything that is that would scare this man. He's been to every single one of the prisons. He's been to the big leagues. And she's going, uh, you might go back to prison for 22 years. He doesn't care at all. He knows he's got all the lawyers in the city behind his back. And they'll get him off all of this. So yeah. I don't know how she thought he was going to reveal anything in this type of, of interrogation. Oh, completely, yeah. And um, the one last piece just on Mr. Theo Rossi and our Mr. Shades. Oh, poor Zip. You will oh, never, man. you will never be <laughs> shades. You will never be shades. I am, as soon as he came in with that bottle, I was like, what? What? Yeah. And then when Diamondback goes, take those off. I was like, ah, mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> poor you little see, Zip. Chris, you, you, little do you know, you've just taken one of my points. Yay! <laughs> and all this right in the world. Um, yeah, I have to say, I love that reaction from Diamondback. Mm-hmm. Just the, that he just was so vehement in, in his response of like take those off yeah. because that he just reminds him of shades at that moment and he he goes rule one of 48 never question the master you know the idea that mm-hmm. zip is doing the same thing as alvarez and it's just winding him up and right. having those shades on loved it absolutely loved that reaction definitely definitely and to be honest, this was also a little bit of my point as well. So, uh, so if I can right, take it, of course, go ahead. Absolutely, cool. Um, Shades gets his groove back. Uh, it was just an awesome, <laughs> awesome scene where we've got Shades surrounded by three or two of the new henchmen and Zip, his p- potential replacement being taken out to be taken out, uh, going up in the lift. I loved this scene. I really, really, really Perfect, worried for yeah. for Shades' life here. Um, I felt this was the end of the Arasi's character. Um, he's gotten out of a lot of things in the past. Um, I thought they were, this was definitely a moment for him. And I thought Zip was going to be stepping up and taking his place. Um, but what a moment when he gets, uh, he gets, he's being choked by Zip, a similar way that we saw one of the other characters in the series being taken out before. Uh, he's thrashing about in the lift and then grabs a gun, shoots two guys, 
gets Sip and kills him as well. It just felt like a real badass moment. I'm on totally on Shades' of side now. Yeah. I want to see that guy survive uh, from many attacks in future. Definitely. I could watch a whole episode of just him and Simone Missick. Absolutely. Just talking to each other back and forth over a table. <laughs> that They could completely forget about the rest of the story and go, well, we're going to hold this over to Luke Cage Season 2, but here's an episode uh-huh. of the two of them just <laughs> replaying scenes, just talking smack to each other. It would be amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. It's also quite funny. We, we, we swore to death he'd had superhero powers mm-hmm. or suits. That's true. And, yeah. Uh, well- yeah. No. He doesn't need them. Doesn't no, need them. one of our predictions is absolutely, totally uh, has not come to pass. Yes. He, do, he does not need them at all. No. I really, really liked uh, this lift strangulation. It, it almost was in slow motion. Um, I loved just the way the camera moved around it, where it was from the top. Mm-hmm. Uh as, as you know, staying in one point as the lift moves slowly up, and you see the fight happening, like really, really good. Yeah. Yeah, and no, it was great cinematography on this piece. John, do you want to take the next point there? Yeah, um, again, I just absolutely adore Mariah Dillard mm. uh, and her character here. And in particular, the one thing I loved was her assistant, Alex. Um, that I wasn't expecting in this episode. That was really cool. And I just loved the turn that he mm-hmm. did in this where... You know, he's kind of been the faithful uh, PA assistant through with her political career. But like you obviously you just immediately get this 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 moment in time where you're like, well, he knows everything else and he is now making that call. He could have gone to the police. He could have gone to the DA. He could have gone to the council. Mm-hmm. But he's saying, I'm going to stand by you. We need to control the narrative and anyone who knows or has seen you with Alvarez or in the club at that time. Um, and I love this transformation of, you know, how can I be of service mm-hmm. to you? Um, and, you, you know, we, we see him later on sort of trailing Candace when she's at the, the park, the Riverside Park meeting Misty Knight, uh, to, to tell her that she will effectively, you know, turn Dillard in, uh, but she's, she's looking for protection. But yeah. I, I really enjoyed this evolution in Dillard's and Alex's uh, relationship uh, yeah. so much. And I I also, you know, mirroring that is how Dillard and um, Alvarez now have become that partnership. Right. But she has suddenly, you know, become the mother hen. I mean, she is Mama Mabel's mm-hmm. shadow that has come to the, f- the fore. And, and, and she talks about this, about how effectively Diamondback has seen um this within her. It's yeah. something that she has been trying to suppress and now she's building her uh, her team uh, of which it's Alex and now Alvarez mm. and that partnership really really good and I mean that gesture of handing over the evidence to her uh, by Alvarez is, is fantastic yeah yeah I had this written in my notes about Alex as uh, as pure man becomes henchman um which I love in the in the real world version of these comic book characters who better than a public relations person than to, to become an evil henchman? I think that's the perfect choice, really, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, th- thanks for that, Derek. For all those who don't know, my previous background was PR. Yeah, uh, yeah that's where yeah. we met, wasn't it, Chris? Yeah, exactly. So I, uh, <laughs> evil henchman. Yes. I'm an evil henchman to this podcast group. Now I, feel, now I know my place. Yeah, that is the <laughs> ultimate backhand compliment. <laughs> <laughs> we love you. Everybody needs an evil henchman. Absolutely. It's worse. You could have called me a minion. <laughs> That's then, true. This is, then you're just expendable. That's different. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, Chris, what's your next point on that evil chortle? It's all about the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Um, go with me on this one. So, like, from the beginning, this show has been primarily about it's Luke's not out to save the world. Mm-hmm. Luke's out to save Harlem. Absolutely. That this, as we head into the finale, this is even more the case. Everything's on a smaller scale than even Daredevil to a degree. Because, okay, like, so Fisk wanted New York. He wanted Hell's Kitchen and mm-hmm. the rest of New York. But, like, Diamondback wants her one Harlem, sure. Yeah. But he's more interested in just getting final revenge on Luke now. 
Like, I, I understand the, the reasoning for that this is Harlem. Everything's about Harlem. Mm-hmm. It's centered in Harlem. It's about Harlem and the community. Yeah. But it's a great way to end the show, but the momentum's and the tension as we're kind of moving into this final battle, they don't, it's not the same stakes almost. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like, it's not like New York City, if Luke loses Diamondback's gonna go after New York City and then the world. Mm. You know yeah. what I mean? Where like yeah, Fisk, yeah. Fisk could have. Fisk wanted all of New York and then everything out of that. Yeah. In fact, and- there's, there's even a, a great moment with, uh, with, um, Colon, uh, Domingo Colon, who's saying that he wants to take the guns and he will then be able to expand beyond these boroughs. Then yeah. maybe, maybe further out than New York. He's definitely not, you know, again, another character that is saying, we're not here to take over the world. We're here to kind of take over our spot within the area. Our spot is Harlem. And then we might be able to expand beyond that when we control everything. This sounds like a negative. It works for what Luke Cage is about and what this journey that Theo, Chio Coker and the rest of the writing staff have brought us on. Mm-hmm. But I think it's starting to f- lose its oomph. It's starting to lose its fizzle as we come in. Like, if anything, this should have started about the neighborhood, been about the neighborhood, and then the realization from Luke, from Missy, that if we don't stop this now, yeah, Harlem's the first to go of yeah. many. And I, I, don't I, I know what you mean. I, I know what you mean. And the one big thing, obviously, I think is that the show couldn't have gone there until Luke had felt like part of the community. Cause he did come in from outside. He's not, he's yeah. not from there. He's from Georgia. So they needed to set up the fact that the community was including him, uh, take out some of the characters around him to give him that passion for Harlem and now bring Harlem back behind him to back him as a character. In fact, Bobby Fish has a great moment with Luke in Pop's Barbershop in this episode where he's talking to him, kind of going, if I had your powers and a hot girl and a great car, I would get in that car, I would drive to the, I would drive out of this area and I would rob a couple of banks on occasion to keep my money going and that'd be it. Why are you doing this? And Luke goes, it is for the community, it is for Harlem. So he's totally in there now. I really love that moment. Uh, and also, just to tie it back into the music, as I, as is my want, uh, in Bulletproof Love, there is a line in the song, which is basically calling out the fact that there is no Iron Man to come in and save them. Um, Luke is their only option. It's basically saying, what do you do when you have no Iron Man? Uh, you go, you look for a person like this, which I think is cool. It's tying it all up together. It's saying that Harlem is ignored by someone like Tony Stark. Um, it is ignored by the other Avengers. The only person that can turn to is a bulletproof back guy. How cool is that? So. No, no, and uh, yeah, again, it sounds like I'm like complaining. I think it's just, I've actually have that on my uh, Google Play mm-hmm. loop now. Uh, if you want, I, I don't have Spotify, Spotify play people. I'm, I'm the I know, well, if we could get Google Podcasts, I'd be on that too, so. Yeah, but give it time, give it time, give it time. Um, But, yeah, no, it was great. It was just, I think it's just, potentially this could have been the first Netflix season then that should have maybe been, like, 11 episodes then. Because I still felt the tension and the build. It's just that being the ultimate crescendo in terms of the stakes. You lose the, you you lose it Mm. to a degree. I, I, I know what you mean. Or... Diamondback has a, a, a thermonuclear <laughs> weapon in Harlem and he's going to set it off and then Luke needs to save Harlem and New York. That's See, how you I think the Defenders are just more personal stories. They're more sto- more stories for those individual characters and their communities around them. Um, Daredevil Season 2 having the hand attack from a different country trying to take over the city. That's a hu- that's a much bigger story. Uh, but Jessica Jones was exactly. all, all about the personal attack on her by another by another superhuman being. So uh, I think it's a bit more similar to, similar in style to that, I suppose. But Diamondback's an arms uh-huh. dealer. He has Shatari <laughs> weapons. Local arms dealer. Like you're kind of going, <laughs> he's, yeah, he's like, he's the local arms dealer compared to like the, the Tesco ch- chain arms dealer that you have around the rest of it. Is that like, he's like, he's the mom and pop yep. shop. Although he's going to be supplying the police, the army with all of these weapons to take down. Uh, to take down the superhero, yeah, so that's so probably his bigger his bigger sure. plan, I suppose, yeah. in future, led by Mariah, obviously. Of course. So, Derek, on that uh, community deafening hate, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's your next point? My next point is just a quick note. Um, ever since episode one of Agents of Shield, we've never seen merchandise for the superheroes. Of all of the shows, of all the 14 films, we haven't seen the merchandise that has been produced around them. Is this the, is this the only other? 
thing that we've seen, the Luke Cage merchandise, bulletproof hoodies. Wait, are you talking <laughs> MCU or are you talking both? Yeah, the only thing I can so the it, only thing, MCU there is the only thing I can remember in uh, in any of the shows was the toys that were in the in the window uh, in the first episode of Agents of Shield tying in the Avengers where the kid is going to buy uh, buy the toys of each of the characters of the Avengers. I don't remember any of the other characters getting um getting toys in Age of Ultron. You have all the people wearing the T-shirts, and at the end of the Avengers, I believe, believe. There was a scene where someone's wearing Captain America shield. Interesting. Um, so th- there's been been a few, been a few, but this is the first Netflix. Aside from the very first episode where he goes, he's hawking the DVDs. Right, right, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I think I think I mean more so. I suppose, obviously, being slightly facetious, this is a much bigger thing than that. This is definitely people uh, like at a rally. They've they're now rallying around Luke Cage wearing the bulletproof hoodies uh, in solidarity with what he's going through. So obviously it's not exactly the same as wearing an Iron Man t-shirt. Uh, that's just fun in the coffers of Tony Stark, I presume. Uh, I presume he gets a good cut in those uh, in those t-shirts. I'm, sure, I'm assuming there's a royalty. Yeah, you would think There that. must be. There must be. But with Luke here, I really like the idea that the city of Harlem are showing their solidarity with him by wearing the bulletproof uh, outfits. I think that's quite cool. Uh, led by Method Man, uh, who traded in his nice camo Um Hoodie for, uh, for with Luke Cage. Which that was a that was a nice little touch. But it wasn't really a cam camo hoodie. It was all trees, and it was a almost like a print. Yeah, it looked like a camouflage hoodie. Yeah, no, it wasn't. Okay, it's wood- it was woodland camouflage, yeah. wasn't it? No, it was just a woodland. It was a scene of a woodland. Oh, I thought it was woodland camouflage. Uh, I, I need I need to get that 4K TV and that 4K Netflix yeah. subscription because I yeah. saw it as just that, just the, no, kind of like the desert camouflage, just stronger the, glasses, the woodland ones. Yeah, maybe stronger glasses. <laughs> anyway, just new prescription was, actually. At this that point. was just a note, John. Do you want to give us your next point? <laughs> yeah, opera glasses. <laughs> My next point is Turk. We have Turk back in here, which Finally, is really someone, nice to see. Someone mentioned it, um, and I really enjoyed both his appearance appearances in this episode mm-hmm. first off with diamondback and, and zip and I, I love his kind of it, it's almost like a forewarning to zip and unfortunately zip is so arrogant he doesn't listen um and obviously he gets himself taken out by alvarez but you know he says i'm his boy yes but i'm definitely not his bitch mm-hmm. um you know <laughs> really nice little uh moment there between turk and zip i love as he's leaving here when he's saying to diamondback yeah, I'm on your side, but only if this is business. I will only be here for business. If it's if it's business, I'm not going to get into your personal squabble, basically. And Dimebag kind of takes it. He doesn't. He yeah, doesn't, he's he's up with that. Doesn't go after him. He just kind of says, "Yeah, I respect your opinion. If if I need you for business, I'll call you again." Yeah, and then because actually we we have learned earlier in the um the series that the reason why he really like was totally with Cottonmouth was that Cottonmouth was good for business. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, Diamondback appreciates that, uh, definitely. Um, I also loved with Turk here, I loved the trash can compactor oh, that so was good. Luke Cage here, um, putting <laughs> Turk in that to get the information about Worst Striker is that was superb. And I loved how Bobby Fish, who knows Turk inside out, uh, how does he get him there? By saying that there's the, the Nike, uh, Jordan runners mm-hmm. from, you know, the, a, a load of them fell off the back of a truck, yeah. you know, come down, take them off my hands for a fee. Um, you know, he realizes Turk is the consummate, like, crooked businessman, Absolutely. ultimately. Yeah, so I love that. It was really nice seeing all of these, uh, different elements through, through this episode with Turk, definitely. Yeah. And I love the final line delivered by Turk in this episode, which is, uh, can you get me out of this? There's child's diapers in here <laughs> <laughs> with me. I thought that was, that was great fun. Chris, do you want to give us your next point? So, um, one of the things I kind of want to continue on about is this kind of, I was talking about how I'm not, they're trying to tie up a lot of it now, and I get that. This mm-hmm. happens in episode 12. You want a nice, neat little package so you can focus on the, the grand finale, of course. if you will. And that's kind of moving ahead with the whole Misty uh, kind of story arc, to a degree. We are, we are She's going to lose her arm, pretty sure now. She keeps wincing and all that, let's be honest. Mm-hmm. If you could imagine you actually have multiple arcs in this story as a piece you have the police 
i.e. Misty and the, the captain and previously a partner and the the police not knowing what they want to do and how they can deal with superheroes and now they have the, the actual bullets and the, they're armed, all that. So there's that element to it, right? As one of the arcs, there's also the community, there's Luke, there's the powers, mm-hmm. there's Diamond Buckle, Cottonmouth, all those. Do they have time to kind of close all that arc up? And that's my kind of question. Right. Like, okay, we've got an hour. Mm-hmm. Well, 59, 50 something minutes. But this, this one was over an hour. This was an hour and five, I think. So. Yeah. yeah. And then the, the finale is probably about an hour. Probably, yeah. 60 yeah. minutes, yeah. Do they have enough time to wrap up everything? That's what I'm kind of starting to get more and more curious about. Like, mm. Missy has the confessions of Candace, mm-hmm. but will she die before she actually gives it to someone else? Well, she has a recording now. That's pretty much probably going to happen. Mm-hmm. We know that. Too. But yeah. I'm more worried about the rest of the story arc. So, like, the police are armed with these severely overpowered weapons. Mm -hmm. Like, how is that going to be cleaned up? Like, what, what's going to happen with the, the captain? Like, they haven't really touched the internal affairs piece in a while. Mm -hmm. That, that, that kind of whole storyline. They need, they have a lot to do and cut this up quickly. Yeah. And I'm just kind of worried they may end up leaving a, a lot on the table. Just because they didn't have time. Uh, in- interesting, yeah. I'm not. I'm not sure. It's one of those weird things with the with the Netflix shows because they have so many episodes overall. If you think about this as yeah. one long series, think about it like that. So we've got 13 episodes of Daredevil, uh, season one, and then another 13 for season two. Jessica Jones plus Luke Cage, Iron Fist coming soon, then Defenders. This is so unlike a normal TV show. They're all in the same universe. They're all connected, as they say. Um, yeah. They don't all te- go exactly hand in hand dealing with some of the elements but they kind of do feel like you're allowed to leave a couple of bits outstanding to come back to in future like for example in jessica jones we obviously had um will travel's character uh will simpson uh taken out of a hospital in the 11th episode and then he disappeared and we've never seen him in any in anything mm-hmm. in luke cage i don't expect him to be an iron fist he may appear up in the vendors or maybe jessica jones I, season I, two he, you know he's on he's, he's on the arrow now he was he's on the arrow now he's left <laughs> but he was so important in that show and i presume he will be coming back at some point because they will have to bring that story back but it felt like a huge cliffhanger as to what was going to happen to him and a huge wide open world potentially coming up in Punisher, for for example. With Misty Knight, while she has been hugely important in the show, it isn't her show, it's Luke's show. Um, so it's entirely possible that they need to keep her in the police department for something to happen later uh, in Defenders, for example, or in one of the other shows. So, um, so while I do understand, I'm just not too sure whether I mind if they tie up everything to do with Misty Knight's character in the show. I think she's been a great presence, obviously. Um, but I don't know whether I need her story to be tied up. I need Luke's to be tied up. I need it, that that bit completely closed out for this series so he can move on and maybe become the hero for hire, as, as John's mentioned earlier on. I'm not sure I need the police department element to be closed out completely. Okay. From looking at like that, maybe. Because like, this won't be touched in Iron Fist at all. Mm. Like, that's uh, easy to understand. Potentially defenders or Punisher. Mm-hmm. Pot- well, no, Punisher. It, less Punisher because Punisher's more gangland, yeah. more kind of like he's not super powered, so they're not going to use super powered weapons on him. Mm-hmm. So potentially defenders. Yeah, to a degree. I just I like this arc. I like yeah. this story. The, the the back and forth between her and the captain. The the intrigue when we found that scarf was like well. A bad and B dead. Mm-hmm. I like that part of it showing that like Harlem, the police force. And remember that story, the, the discussion they had, Scarf and Missy had back and forth. Mm-hmm. What was it? Like episode three, four? I don't even remember now. It was where they had that back about like what are us cops supposed to do. Yeah. I like that story arc. So I just, I would like to see it more wrapped up, I think. And I'm just, I don't think they're going to have time. Right. And I, but if they hold it, if they do do it in Defenders, I'm happy. Mm-hmm. If they don't touch it until then, or they don't touch it even in Defenders, uh, Chia Croker's getting a letter 
of annoyance for me. <laughs> well, let's see. Just putting that out Let's there. see. We do still have another episode to go. An hour, remember, is half the time a movie has. So there is quite a lot of time to fill in that hour. Yeah. So uh, you never know. There could be could be a bit more. I'm just going to go on to my final point because it is slightly connected to Misty Knight. It's really to do with the opening of the episode. There's a really great moment between her and Luke. And I love how she handles it. Um, where she's standing with all the police surrounding her just after the attack on Harlan's Paradise. And he's being about to be taken off. I love that she gives him all the information that he needs but makes it sound like she's given him a dressing down. It's absolutely perfect. Um, she's totally on his side because he is the one that saved her, remember, in Harlan's Paradise in episode 10. Yeah. So he's te- she's telling him, um, everybody around you has guns with modified Judas bullets, which you, a piece of information you wouldn't have known if I didn't tell you that. Um, they are not looking for anybody else because your friend is in the wind. She clearly knows that um, that Diamondback isn't Luke's friend. So she's giving them that piece of information. He's on the run. They haven't caught him. They're not going to be going after anybody else and make sure you take care of it before I get to the police station. Um, so I love how that's done because it's a really well acted scene. She needs to tell him all of this information so that he can escape and get away from the police, uh, which he needs to do because they're not going to be letting him go anytime soon unless he gets himself out of there. Uh, I really like that idea. And then she gets back to the police station to work on getting him released from uh, from the system effectively which i thought was just really cool i love the way it was love the way it was handled and of course she does get one of my favorite lines so far in the series uh, as she's um as she steps up off her off her bed in the ambulance and they go uh, miss knight please sit back down she goes it's detective night and i'm fine <laughs> which i love <laughs> damn right yeah this was really good i i loved this and i think she had another really um great moment but off screen i i loved it when um bobby fish and, and luke cage are discussing about the parlay and all that but the conversation moves to misty Knight, and i love the fact that luke cage goes we've got to be careful with her she's trying to clear me uh, and clear my name in the precinct and she's trying to bring me in on the outside like th- there's still a bit of like, I, I think I'm beginning to trust her and she's one of us, but we've got to be careful with her. Yeah. I, I love that um, little yeah. conversation that the, the two of them had in Pop's uh, barbershop. Absolutely. Absolutely. John, do you have any notes? I do. It's Vodka Watch with me and Mariah. Um, she has a nice mm-hmm. bottle of Belvedere mm-hmm. um, on the desk, swigging away with a table full of money. Now, if that doesn't shout Russian. Um, I don't know what does. But yeah, no, the, the the Belvedere vodka and the bag of money on the table. Loved it. It felt Loved like that. an updated version of Scarface, really. Yeah, it, yeah absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Um, also, I loved when Luke kicks in the door uh, to Diamondback's lair. I it just, it, that was, was really good illustration of his power, a bit like with the compactor or, or, of the... Um, the trash can compactor whilst Turk was in it. I really, how they captured his powers there. I thought within this, the, the special effects was really, really good. And of course it is remiss of us not to go RIP Domingo colon mm-hmm. hold yeah. to the chest with diamondbacks. Uh, well, actually I don't think he had a hold to his chest, but uh, all his other uh, thugs, did the rest of his gang did but basically diamondback has taken out all his competition at the moment um which may be perfect uh a perfect moment for the mariah alvarez combination to come <laughs> in and take the space back so uh really enjoyed uh seeing domingo get his comeuppance in that sense uh because it, it gives a whole host of possibilities to uh to the mariah alvarez uh axis but i do think it is R.I.P. Domingo. It is, yeah, and it was definitely one of my notes as well. It's something that we mentioned, I think, in the second episode of the series. How is Luke Cage going to take out all of the criminals in the city? Uh, He's so strong, he's so powerful. Is he not just able to kill them all? Well, actually, Diamondback has killed every single other criminal leader in the city, (laughs) and now he's just killed uh, Domingo Colon in this episode as well. So, uh, So, yeah, so it's all free and clear. If Luke can take out him and get Mariah and uh, Shades behind bars, that's it. Harlem has won, right? Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much, definitely. And Derek, do you have any notes? I love the little call out of um, of live free or die. You don't want to go all New Hampshire on me here uh, when the cop is <laughs> yeah. talking to Luke Cage. So just in case for those of us who are outside the States, that is the uh, that is the number plate message that is on everybody in New Hampshire's. It's live free 
uh, or die obviously taken by live free or die hard uh, as well uh, that's where it came from so just i like that little call out as well um yeah the meeting with uh, with luke and method man where he calls out plo style was my joint as a kid really cool um, i'm sure chio coker who's a huge fan of wu-tang, wu-tang clan and is actually really good friends with method man I kind of feel he wrote that line so he could kind of say it to, to uh, the method man himself. Um, but I love that moment between the two of them because it's one of those ones that you hear stars talk about all the time when they bump into people on the street and they look at them and go, you're you. No, you're you. <laughs> you know, so you have the two characters looking at each other going, I know you from somewhere. Who are you again? Oh, yeah, you're that guy. I uh, thought that was quite cool. <laughs> yeah, no, very cool. Pretty good fun. But on that note, I think it's time to get into our defense, gentlemen. Chris, do you defend this episode of Luke Cage? I'm 50-50, guys, I'm, or 60-40 against, I'm sorry. This kind of penultimate episode for season one, it was felt like it was more interesting kind of setting up the final episode than offering any more kind of intriguing storytelling. Um, it was just, it was very by-the-numbers piece. Um, it felt like they wanted to really... Hammer home the fuck the 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 one of the plot points of of a, a black superhero who's bulletproof and the pretty much kind of plodding along plot progression kind of diminished a lot of what would have been a great season as I said like about the community piece it's just it's been going on for so long and the stakes haven't risen it just kind of stayed at a plateau it just. It's diminishing this, what should be a cliffhanger. Oh my God. Like I'm holding onto the edge of my seat for this whole hour because I know there's one episode left and everything is hinging on this next hour. It just didn't set up that for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so unfortunately, I, as I said, I, I, I could take it or leave it as a, as a penultimate episode and that's, I, I don't want to say I def- not do not defend it. I don't want to say I do defend it. It has points for both. Mm-hmm. So I'm meh. Is, is, is that is that is that the in between? No. If can I do can I do a shrug? There's no in between. The, you either defend it or yeah. you don't. And it sounds okay. like you can't fully defend it. So that's, uh, that's no, okay. I can't that's fully allowed. defend it. So then it's a no. That's allowed. Okay, John, do you defend this episode of Luke Cage? I do. Um... Just defend this episode of Luke Cage. I would give it a three or three point five pimped up stormtroopers out of five. <laughs> Again, I think there's a real lot to like in this episode. I love um the Method Man's cameo and I love that whole Heroes for Hire piece. Um I think there's some really good aspects of performance in this, especially uh around Diamondback and uh, Alvarez with regards to, um, you know, take these off as he says to Zip. And I really like that interaction uh, of Diamondback, Zip and Turk. Having Turk in here is a really nice, um, and, and for a sustained period, he's not just in right at the start or yeah. that, you know, he comes in at several points here, um, or is alluded to, uh, really good. Again, for me, I, I think this is maybe part of why I am slightly uh, bringing it down, is that for me, it was Mariah Dillard um, and her arc that absolutely was the thing I was focusing on, and not Luke Cage's, which for a penultimate episode was really odd for me. Mm. I, I, um, really odd. I really enjoyed um, the enjoyed uh, Method Man's rap and all of that, but I suppose maybe it took me out of the of the move of this series to the clash between uh, Luke Cage and and, and Diamondback. Mm. And I, to be honest, I, I still feel as though I'm a bit concerned that it may just whimper out um, and we don't have it fully emotionally resolved. And I, I think that's I still feel it's being held at a distance by the show, um, and I'm not entirely sure why. I don't think um, I cannot defend this episode, because I still enjoyed it, but um, I suppose it's within the context of the final episode that maybe this this episode may be better or not as good as I first thought. But there's a lot to like in this for me, uh, absolutely. And, you know, I, I love the the, the the aspect of this episode that does come a, and discuss 
Luke as a figurehead within the community. You know, that is, mm-hmm. that is uh, really important. Again, I can understand elements of what, um, Chris has mentioned about maybe it could have been a bit earlier. But again, I don't think that's necessarily to do with this part. I actually just think that structurally, maybe such a definitive split in this series between Cottonmouth and Diamondback may have just caused a bit of problems with pacing somewhere along the line. And I think that's that, that is what this episode for me has. And that's why I probably just knock it back, but I still defend this episode of Luke Cage. So Derek. Uh, do you defend this episode of Luke Cage? Do you know, I do. I do. There's, there's definitely enough to like in this episode to defend it and recommend it to anybody to watch. Uh, it's not an episode I would have skipped, um, particularly with that those moments with Method Man. And again, having Turk Paris back, you know, I love that. Uh, having Shades get his groove back, awesome. Really, really enjoyed that. So, um, so yes, while I feel that there's, there's still more story to tell, they didn't squeeze everything out of every single minute of this episode. And it's a long one as well. There's, there's a, we've said it before, the episodes that go over about 55 minutes, uh, tend to feel a lot longer, but there's a lot going on, a lot that needed to wrap up in this episode. So, uh, I will defend it and I will, uh, I will excitedly return for our final episode of, uh, episode 13. Absolutely. Can't wait. Yep. Completely. I, the, this has been a great show and I don't want some mm-hmm. of the, my negative, points to take away from this this as a season has been amazing but let's wait and see i I am dying to after this as soon as we end this recording i am running off to watch it and remember you can provide feedback at feedback at defenderstvpodcast.com or you can leave feedback or any discussion points on our facebook group just go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash defenders tv podcast brilliant come join us again for the final episode of luke cage you know my steez don't know what it means but it will allow us to get rid of two two of the seven deadly sins envy because we finally get to see the episode and i've been jealous of every single one of our listeners who's watched it so yes envy will be gone after this and will allow us to get into sloth uh, for the Christmas period, once we finish episode 13, we'll be sitting on the couch, no longer podcasting about Luke Cage over the Christmas period. So, uh, so yeah, Sloth is coming soon. We forgot about gluttony. Yeah, gluttony as Christmas, well. Christmas yeah. and Thanksgiving dinner, people. Very true. It's coming. Very true. Oh, yeah. But never any wrath from our podcasters. <laughs> no. no. Absolutely. No. Not today. Maybe tomorrow. We'll see. Uh-huh. Depends whether we get our feed sorted out. Yeah. <laughs> it depends whether we get what we want from the final episode of Luke Cage, I think. Yes. Uh, yeah. But thank you so much for joining us. Really good to have you, as always. Uh, keep listening to the podcast. Keep subscribing. Keep leaving us reviews over on iTunes just by going through DefendersTVPodcast.com slash iTunes or by finding us any good or evil podcast catcher by searching for Defenders TV Podcast. Absolutely. Uh, now we've got a hero for hire. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, and we'll be back with you uh, next time. See you guys. See ya. You think I'm holding back? You think I'm holding back? I'm out to save you. Thanks for listening to Defenders TV Podcast, a TV podcast industries production. Our theme tunes provided by the wonderful Mississippi McDonald and the Cottonmouth Kings. If you want to help out the podcast and you've enjoyed listening to us, there's some really easy ways to do it. If you can share our episodes through your social media channels like Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, or Google+, that gets some extra listeners into us. If you want to leave us a review on iTunes or a rating, just leave a five-star rating, click the button, or go to iTunes through DefendersTVPodcast.com slash iTunes. We'll take you straight to our page and leave us a review or a rating there. That always helps out independent podcasts. And also, as always, we love to hear your feedback about the show's interaction with our audience is what we really, really love. So you can send us feedback to feedback at DefendersTVPodcast.com. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.